Well, I've got seven o'clock, so we'll get started. The first thing I'm going to say is today's December 7th. For young people, that's a day that'll live in infamy. This is the 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor Day. Um, just giving you some historical context. Um, today's speaker, Dr. Vail, uh, who he and I have not met until just now. Uh, I think he's a new faculty member in pediatric dermatology. Um, but I took a look at his slides. It's going to be an excellent presentation. Atopic dermatitis and its mimics. Uh, so go ahead. And well, thank you, Dr. Altman. Yeah, I'm Max Vale. I'm a new faculty at the University of Washington. Um, I'm actually originally from Missouri and came out here for my training uh, at the U and then decided to join on as faculty. And uh, I primarily practice at the UW Roosevelt Clinic. And then I have a clinic at uh, Seattle Cancer Care doing some supportive oncodermatology and uh, high-risk cancer screenings there. And so I'm thrilled to be joining you guys today for the UW Allergy Immunology Teaching Series. And um, we'll talk about atopic dermatitis and its mimics. Uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time, put some messages in the chat, uh, and we'll have some time at the end for some questions. I'm also supposed to remind you to uh, please mute yourselves. I think it looks like everyone on the call is muted. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I have no disclosures. So we have four main objectives today. The first is to review our current understanding of the pathophysiology of atopic dermatitis or eczema, which I'll use interchangeably, and then also that of the atopic march. Hopefully to become familiar with some of the most common presentations and complications of eczema in both kiddos and adults. To review some of the foundations, at least from my perspective, in the management of atopic dermatitis. And then to identify the mimics of atopic dermatitis that everyone should be aware of in during clinic. And I will say what I won't cover today is an in-depth review of immunology. You guys would teach me more than I'd teach you in that regard. Um, we won't do a deep dive into the pharmacology of the management strategies for uh, atopic dermatitis. And I won't be focusing on some of the immunodeficiency syndromes that include eczema as part of their uh, syndrome cluster. So what we see here is probably what you classically think of when you think of eczema or atopic dermatitis, a scaly red rash on flexural surfaces, some areas that have been scratched at and have thickened, elbows, knees, hands. And eczema truly is the itch that rashes. The most troubling symptom, symptom for patients with eczema is itch. They scratch and rub and then they develop a rash. And that's how we get into what's called the itch scratch cycle. We have the sensation of itch in our skin, we scratch it, that leads to more itch. And what happens along this process is further scratching leads to thickening of the skin or lichenification and erosions. Erosions impair the skin barrier in someone who's already predisposed to a disrupted barrier can lead to superinfection. Superinfection and inflammation due to allergen exposure in the skin leads to inflammation. Inflammation triggers nerve hypersensitivity, which contributes to more itch. And then all of this is overlaid with the stress, anxiety, and often depression that uh, accompanies atopic dermatitis and the perception of self-worth when there's rash on the face and hands, which only then further contributes to itch by lowering the itch threshold. In kiddos especially, this is a big contributor to restless nights from itching, scratching, um, that can lead to poor sleep, affect concentration and school performance, and adversely affect uh, development. So that was kind of the clinical uh, ideology of atopic dermatitis, but I want to dive deeper and talk about the um, molecular and cellular pathophysiology of eczema. So the why. On the bottom left, you see a, a slide of normal skin, H&E stain. And the first major component of four things that contribute to eczema is epidermal barrier dysfunction. I think of the top layer of the skin, the stratum corneum and granulosum as a brick wall, um, where the keratinocytes or the cells are the bricks, and the complex lipid structure contributes to the mortar. 
well, there's defect with this in patients with eczema, the most common mutation of which is the filaggrin mutation that's well known. Uh, filaggrin is a keratin filament aggregating protein, which not only does it organize the mortar of that brick wall, but it also is itself broken down into several molecules that contribute to hydration, barrier function, appropriate pH balance in the skin. Defects in filaggrin are super common in patients with eczema, and it's also the uh, genetic defect that's responsible for the disease ichthyosis vulgaris, which is strongly associated with much of the atopic dermatitis phenotype. <clears throat> Something to note is filaggrin, however, is not found in GI and bronchial mucosa. So as we'll talk about later with atopic march, this alone is certainly not a reason to explain atopic tendencies develop in other organ systems. The second piece of the why is immune dysregulation. Um, we know that patients with eczema have a very TH2 skewed immune phenotype. Um, some of this is probably acquired based on epidermal barrier defect and several other things we'll talk about, but there's more and more data coming out that there are fundamental inherited defects or dysregulations in patients with eczema's immune system favoring a TH2 skewed response. There's upregulation of IL-4 and IL-13, which are two of the most common interleukins and cytokines involved. Um, unfortunately, elevation in IL-4 and IL-13 further downregulates filaggrin, which then leads to worsening uh, skin barrier dysfunction. This whole cascade activates eosinophils and mast cells. It leads to nonspecific IgE elevation and production systemically. And the other uh, component that we need to know about is TSLP or thymic stromal lymphopoietin, which not only turns up the TH2 type response, but itself is triggered by some of the things that make eczema worse. Aeroallergens, microorganisms, um, pollution like diesel exhaust, which is one reason why uh, climate change and, and worsening air quality contributes to eczema and disproportionately affects some in our communities more than others. Cigarette smoke, chemical irritants, among others. The third component of this tetrad for explaining eczema is alteration of the microbiome. We know that compared to only 5% of unaffected patients, 90% of eczema patients are colonized with staph. Now, I don't know the data for colonization of us as healthcare workers, probably somewhere in between there, but um, certainly patients with eczema are disproportionately colonized with staph. And we know that during flares of atopic dermatitis or eczema, the bacterial biodiversity of the skin drops precipitously such that staph, which normally accounts for about 35% of the cutaneous microbiome, jumps up to 90%. So all of a sudden you have much decreased biodiversity in the skin during eczema flares. And then some people have looked at this further and realized that there's maybe some benefit from bacterial transplant. So taking coag negative staph, so staph epidermidis primarily, and transplanting that onto the skin has been shown, at least in um, early studies, to benefit and reduce some of the inflammation and symptoms of eczema. The fourth component is that itch, this neuropathic itch. Um, so some of this is simply from the itch scratch cycle. We also know that staph infection often releases the staph superantigen, which specifically increases IL-31, one of those Th2 type cytokines. The receptor for IL-31 is not only found in keratinocytes, eosinophils, but it's also actually found on the cutaneous C nerve fibers in the dorsal root ganglion cells, which directly aggravates the sensation of itch and pain in the skin for eczema patients. Staph colonization even uh, stimulates the degranulation of mast cells, which contributes to the TH2 skew. And IL-14 and IL-13 are stimulated by um, staphylococcus, and they also stimulate the uh, afferent neurons that contribute to itch sensation via JAK signaling pathway. And we'll talk a little bit later about JAK pathway as it relates to eczema. So in summary, the, the four main pillars of the pathogenesis of eczema are skin barrier dysfunction, immune dysregulation or dysfunction, alteration in the microbiome, and some degree of itch or nerve sensitization contributed by the former three. So now that we understand how eczema gets started, what happens once it's set up in a patient? 
So there's this idea of the atopic march. And I think this was developed, this kind of came to be around 30 years ago with the realization that many patients with severe eczema had a stepwise progression of several atopic tendencies from eczema to food allergy, to asthma, and eventually uh, allergic rhinitis or rhinoconjunctivitis. And as for food allergy, there's obviously debate. You guys, um, I'm sure I'd love to get your perspective on this too, but whether this is an atopic dermatitis to food allergy pathway or an atopic dermatitis and food allergy pathway, if they're truly concomitant diseases. But we know asthma comes a little bit later and around age four through six, and uh, most of the allergic rhinitis coming in the um, later childhood years. Some also consider the in-stage atopic tetrad or you know, five, <laughs> a group of five conditions to include eosinophilic esophagitis, which is less well-established and um, certainly less common. And the idea behind all of this is since atopic dermatitis definitely comes first in these patients developing in infancy, perhaps <clears throat> if it's not causative, it's at least contributory to the development of these atopic uh, conditions. So what are the proposed mechanisms? Well, this could be an entire grand rounds in itself, and I'm certainly not the, uh, the bench uh, side researcher to explain all of this, but the primary idea is the idea of epicutaneous sensitization. We know that an impaired skin barrier interacts differently with the world around us, since the skin's primary function is to protect us from the world around us. And so the idea is allergens enter through this disrupted skin barrier, that, as we've seen, stimulates TSLP, for example, as well as IL-25 and IL-33. That, in turn, activates basophils, mast cells, signaling through dendritic cells, the eosinophils, setting up for a TH2 type and IgE-elevated phenotype that then causes inflammation in the local lymph nodes. And that inflammatory milieu we've seen actually makes its way into the respiratory and digestive tract, even from just cutaneous sensitization. Later on then when aeroallergens or food allergens are re-encountered or maybe even encountered for the first time in a new tissue type, there's a lower threshold for sensitization and an exaggerated response. <clears throat> we know that in many mice studies, um, if you uh, stimulate an impaired skin barrier, either with abrasion or tape stripping of the mice skin, a mimic of eczema, and then expose the mice to egg protein or peanut protein, they then will develop systemic egg and peanut-specific IgE responses. They have demonstrated as a result of that IgE mast cell expansion in the GI tract, again, from skin stimulation alone, um, increased serum levels, so systemic levels of IL-4, uh, and TSLP, that thymic stromal lymphopoietin dependent basophil expansion in the skin, leads to antigen-specific Th2 type cytokine response, which then has been shown to be associated with increased IgE and mast cell accumulation in the gut, akin to an IgE-mediated food allergy. And with subsequent re-exposure in these mice to an oral challenge of egg protein or peanut, many developed a systemic anaphylactic response. Similar findings have been shown for asthma syndromes as well. Um, when mice were exposed, again, through this epicutaneous sensitization to aspergillus, they later developed airway hyperresponsiveness that looked like asthma when they were given an aeroallergen challenge to, to aspergillus. Um, similarly, epicutaneous um, egg protein exposure to tape strip skin developed into bronchial eosinophilia and airway hyperresponsiveness on subsequent bronchial egg protein challenge. And then finally, in some mice, they actually injected into the skin TSLP and egg protein, TSLP uh, being one of the most important um, chemicals to cause sensitization. And what they showed was the skin developed an eczema-like rash. And then when they later did an egg protein airway challenge, they developed an asthma-like phenotype. But there are other mechanisms too that have been proposed. Certainly, the alteration of the cutaneous microbiome has been shown to actually alter the gut microbiome, and that contributes to systemic inflammation and perhaps food allergy. And TSLP, that really important uh, chemical mediator in sensitization, is not only found in levels in the skin, but also the airway and gut. 
and is perhaps one explanation for this cross organ communication. And then finally, many of the uh, patients with atopic tendencies have shared genetic abnormalities, both in skin and immune function, and in how they respond to the microbiome. And so perhaps these are all clustered together, leading for propensity for the development of atopy. So what kind of things don't prevent the atopic march or don't prevent eczema? There are a lot of common misconceptions that patients come to me with with how can we maybe, if we stop their eczema, prevent them from developing asthma, allergies, those kind of things. One common question is uh, exclusive soy milk or um, using a soy formula to enhance um, breastfeeding or augment breastfeeding. There's no risk reduction associated with soy formula. A prolonged exclusive breastfeeding beyond three to four months also has not been shown to prevent atopic dermatitis or the march. Mom avoiding all and <laughs> all and any antigens during pregnancy. I don't know, maybe she's just ready to go into the COVID ward there, but um, does not affect the likelihood of her kiddo developing uh, atopic dermatitis. And even avoiding house dust mites in patients that are sensitized is not associated with risk reduction in the prevent or prevention of the atopic march. So next, I want to touch briefly on the again that atopic. Dermatitis. That's just a question on that last point on dust mite. Once you have atopic dermatitis, is uh, avoidance of dust mites uh, a treatment modality for existing atopic dermatitis? Yes. So there, totally, and and I'll talk a little bit later about how to um, how allergy management plays a role in eczema management. But yes, 100%, once there's a truly clinically relevant sensitization to house mite, it can be helpful. And as I approach atopic dermatitis and food allergy, I do want to say this is a dermatologist perspective. Um, I think we all have um, somewhat biased opinions because of the patient populations we see. I see fewer patients with real food allergy. You guys see many patients with real food allergy. And so we approach it differently. But what I wanna share is that many patients in dermatology clinic, especially in pediatrics, come to dermatologists and say, I gotta understand why my kid has eczema and I really think it's their food. I'm sure you're familiar with that too. And they wanna blame food. They demand food allergy testing, even though their kiddo has no GI symptoms um, because they're, they're searching for some explanation for this systemic and genetic condition. Um, we do know that up to a third of patients with pretty severe atopic dermatitis have food allergy. It's part of the atopic march. But 85% of children with eczema have elevated IgE, both to food and inhalant allergens. And some of that is really not clinically relevant. That sensitization perhaps is from exposures and perhaps from non-specific IgE expansion as part of the atopic phenotype. So for these patients, I always say the first step for us from a skin perspective is to optimize their skin treatment. And then if they're still flaring, despite my best efforts, that's when we should explore, are there other allergies, perhaps food that could be contributory? We also know, unfortunately, that food restrictive diets that parents elect to start on their own have significant risks of malnourishment and nutritional deficiencies if not carefully structured. And in reality, food allergy is not a big contributor to eczema, not as much as asthma and allergic rhinitis and cutaneous allergy. Um, the normal cycle of eczema is to get better and then flare and then get better and flare. And so for patients who are basically consistent with their diet, those flares are more likely to hear their underlying eczema cycling and unlikely related to food changes. Furthermore, Eczema flaring from a food culprit really should happen within minutes to hours or hours to days from that food exposure and is usually not delayed like some parents think. Um, there was a Cochrane review in 2008 that looked at about 400 children and adults with eczema and uh, tried them on different exclusion diets, milk and egg, a, food, a few foods diet, an elemental diet, and none of them were shown to be beneficial in these unselected eczema patients to prevent or reduce their eczema symptoms. So the atopic March takeaways are, one, eczema is not a skin disease, it's a systemic disease. Two, 
it's still hard to say if this is truly a march or if it's really just a clustering of really closely linked um, conditions. And it's still kind of unclear what we can do or if preventing eczema will really prevent or reduce the severity of subsequent atopic tendencies with food allergy, asthma, and allergic rhinoconjunctivitis. Um, one of the big things that came out in the past three to four years in dermatology was the idea of neonatal moisturization. So as soon as your kiddo's born, slather them from head to toe in Vaseline and Aquaphor, and maybe that'll prevent eczema from developing. And initially, some of the studies looked really promising. Unfortunately, there was a really big, well-powered review, Cochrane review in 2021, that showed basically it's not effective. And in fact, these kiddos were developing um, skin infections at higher rates than their counterparts. So it's not something we routinely recommend beyond normal moisturization. There is some data that early treatment with uh, anti-inflammatory agents like mecrolimus can reduce the development of asthma and allergic rhinitis, perhaps from reducing that systemic inflammatory response, even when applied topically. Um, in older patients, sub-Q and sublingual immunotherapy has been shown in atopic patients to prevent some of the progression from asthma and aller worsening allergic rhinitis. And then there's some um, kind of plus minus data about pre and probiotics for mothers and infants and early exposure to dogs, probably more than cats, um, in reducing subsequent sensitization. Okay, now we'll change gears and I'll get a drink. And move on to talking about what eczema actually looks like. So one way to look at the multiple types of skin lesions and atopic dermatitis is, is it acute, subacute, or chronic? The acute lesions of eczema are those that are weepy, crusted, eroded, sometimes vesiculated, like you can see here in the antecubital fossa, these papillo vesicles. Subacute eczema is the classic eczema most of us visualize, and that's redness with scale and crusting and excoriation from scratching. And then chronic eczema, which is more common in adults with really thickened or lichenified skin, very scaly, and sometimes even with the development of what's called parigonodules, which are these hyperpigmented, often centrally excoriated, uh, firm bumps from picking and scratching. Another way to break up eczema is how does it look across ages? Uh, infantile eczema is very different than adult eczema. It more commonly affects the cheeks and the forehead and neck. Uh, as well as the extensor surfaces, so elbows and knees. And it lasts from age, well, birth, usually within the first couple months to about age two. Interestingly, kiddos with eczema often have central facial sparing. So it really is cheeks, chin, and forehead, but not the nose, not around the mouth as much. And in this kiddo with more melanin-rich skin who has really severe eczema on their extensor arm, you can also see follicular prominence. So follicular papules and follicular prominence is really common eczema presentation in patients of skin of color. In childhood and adult years, the eczema transitions to what we usually think of, which is affecting the flexural surfaces of the neck, elbows, wrists, the popliteal fossa, and then sometimes local eczema of the hands, feet, and eyelids. This eczema is usually less acute and is more the subacute and chronic types with scaliness, lichenification, parigonodule change, and is more associated with widespread cirrhosis. There are plenty of other stigmata for atopic dermatitis that we won't cover, but one I do want to is hyperlinearity of the palms. So on the far left is a normal looking palm, on the middle is kind of a somewhat hyperlinear palm, and on the far right, a very hyperlinear palm, both in the depth of the grooves on the hands and also this prominent cross hatching on the thenar eminence. There's actually a strong association between palmar hyperlinearity and the filigran mutation with a 71% positive predictive value. So it's certainly something I find myself looking in patients who have a rash that I'm trying to say, is this eczema or will it be eczema? I look on their hands, and if I see this, I think, well, even if they don't have eczema yet, they certainly are at risk. The other stigmata of atopic dermatitis uh, include things like keratosis pilaris. Those are those scaly follicularly based papules, especially on the upper arms and thighs um, that are associated with eczema that are not specific to it. 
Denny Morgan lines, which are also associated with the uh, allergic tetrad, um, which are these atopic pleats or uh, adipitous uh, transverse folds on the lower eyelid, sometimes the upper eyelid as well. And then down here you see pityriasis alba, which is hypopigmented macules and patches often on the face of patients with skin of color. And it's felt to be kind of a low-grade dermatitis with post-inflammatory inflammation that causes eczema of the face and sometimes trunk and extremities. So now earlier we talked about how staph infection is one of the most common infections in patients with eczema. So let's see what it looks like. Here you see on a flexural surface and on a hand, a patch of eczema with this prominent gold encrusting. Eczema itself should not cause gold encrusting. So when you see this, that should be the red flag for staph superinfection or impetigo. Most of these patients, after you do a bacterial, a bacterial swab, can be managed with topicals, which we'll talk about. But some, if widespread, really do require oral doxycycline or other antimicrobial agents. The other infection that's really important in patients with eczema, especially pediatrics, is this. And that is when you see a patch of eczema with these punched out, relatively monomorphic clustering uh, areas, you should get your viral PCR swab and swab aggressively because this is HSV superinfection or eczema herpeticum. This should always be treated with systemic antiviral agents and in kiddos can be life-threatening. Um, and in all age groups, if it's occurring near the eyes, is uh, obviously very concerning and can result in severe ophthalmologic complications. Another interesting uh, manifestation of eczema we see in kiddos, especially, is molluscum dermatitis. So molluscum is a common pediatric infection. It's caused by a pox virus. And we know that molluscum tends to gravitate towards areas of disrupted skin barrier. But also we see in atopic kiddos, that when they develop a spot of molluscum, they often develop a patch of eczema around it. And the idea behind this is the atopic kids are so skewed toward that Th2 type response that they mount this inappropriate eczema-like response to the molluscum rather than the more appropriate Th1 type response that's needed to clear the virus. So what we do is we actually put a topical steroid on it. We reduce that Th2 response and calm down the eczema. And then eventually the immune system hopefully wakes up to the molluscum and clears it. Okay, another transition point. Now we'll move on to the management of atopic dermatitis. I don't know if you're familiar with the show, but uh, this was my transition slide to talk about red light, green light. One of the most important things about managing patients with eczema is having the idea of an eczema action plan akin to what we use for asthma. And this really highlights for patients and especially parents that control is the goal, not cure. So I have my patients understand what's their day-to-day -day maintenance plan or for their maintenance plan for low-grade eczema at their typical hotspots. And then what do they need to do separately when they're having a significant flare? Another way that I approach thinking about how to treat eczema is a four pillar approach. This is modeled after the four um, pathogenic features of atopic dermatitis. First is dealing with dryness and barrier dysfunction. Second is dealing with inflammation. Third is dealing with infection and staph colonization. And fourth is specifically targeting that neuropathic itch. So to repair the dryness and um, disrupted barrier, um, we need emollients. Um, and creams versus ointments. So creams and ointments are better than lotions, which have alcohol. They're more cosmetically appealing, but um, are less moisturizing. Creams have some degree of water content. So throughout the day, they're a great moisturizer. Ointments, however, have basically zero water content, but they're a, a totally occlusive barrier. So I prefer ointments, which patients like less well, especially after baths, when the skin is already well hydrated. When the skin is dry, an ointment is not going to bring extra moisture to the skin. Bathing education is obviously critical. Patients need to know that they should take warm, not hot showers, five to 10 minutes when they bathe, minimize how much soap they use only to the smelly areas, that's armpits and groin, or whatever other areas are culturally appropriate. Um, and most patients don't need to bathe every day. The one exception to this is 
I see a lot of patients, especially in the teenage years during the summertime, who come to me with their eczema flare specifically on their face, neck, upper shoulders, backs of their arms and hands after they've been out at soccer practice, where they've been exposed to grass, pollens, tree pollens, all of those. And so for those patients, rinsing off, not necessarily a full bath with soap and all of that, but even rinsing off at the end of the day, all those aeroallergens can be really helpful in treating their eczema on their skin. So it's the one time I say bathing every day is probably okay. There's also the idea of a soak and smear or soak and seal. And this is the idea that emollients or topical steroids are best applied right after showering when the skin is well hydrated to lock in that moisture. The next pillar is reducing inflammation in the skin. <clears throat> we start with something we're all very familiar with, topical corticosteroids. I have two rules for topical corticosteroids that I go over with my patients. And one is the right steroid for the right surface. And two is the 50% rule. So I have favorite steroids that I tend to use and gravitate toward for thin skin like the face. I use Hydrocort 2.5 or Desinine. For the trunk and extremities, I always reach for Trion 0.1. And for hands and feet, or if there's a significant flare on the trunk and extremities, I go for clobetazole 0.05. The equivalent to that is betamethasone augmented of the same percentage. So what I tell patients are, if you use the right steroid in the right spot, and you use it 50% of the time, so that's a couple days on, a couple days off, a week on, a week off, two weeks on, two weeks off, as long as it's that 50% mark, you really don't have to stress out about thinning of the skin. Now, if you break one of those rules, all bets are off. Um, and I find that patients are usually reassured by that. Um, the other side effects of uh, topical steroids that we should know about on the face and acneiform eruption like rosacea. Um, sometimes patients on hair bearing skin, arms and legs especially, if they really rub the steroid in, can give themselves a folliculitis. And obviously, rarely topical steroids um, results in an allergic contact dermatitis. <clears throat> and in that situation, I recommend they use desoxymetazone, which is a, a separate um, non-reactive steroid. Patients can also, for their hot spots, switch to a maintenance plan for topical steroids, using it maybe twice a week, versus the really intense red light treatment where they're using it twice a day consistently for two weeks. The next topical anti-inflammatory we use mostly is topical calcineurin inhibitors. Um, these are great for the face, intertriginous areas, and as maintenance, but you have to remember these come in small tubes. So for patients with widespread eczema or a lot of body surface area, there's no one pound jar option. So these are kind of limited. <clears throat> uh, Pemecrolimus and Tacro 0.03 are approved for ages two plus. And then the Tacro 0.1 ointment is approved for age 16 plus. Tacro 0.1 is the strongest, and its equivalence in steroid terms is about that of triamcinolone, just for context when you're thinking about how likely is this to work. And the main limiting side effect is burning and stinging with application, and some degree of facial flushing in adults when they have alcohol, almost like a disol from like reaction. The idea of wet wraps, we use a lot, especially in pediatric dermatology, but in adults also. And this is the idea that after bathing in warm water, the skin is very well moisturized. So then after patting uh, down with the towel, uh, the topical steroid is applied. A pair of wet pajamas or a pair of wet undergarments uh, that are warm and wrung out is applied to the skin. And on the top of that, a layer of dry clothing is applied. This, um, it's beneficial for several ways. It increases via occlusion the uh, penetration of the topical steroid, and it also is extremely moisturizing. And for many patients can be about as equivalent as a course of oral prednisone for a week um, without the systemic prednisone five side effects. The next topical ways we reduce inflammation are some newer agents, Crisaverol, which came out a couple of years ago, a PDE4 inhibitor, phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor. The nice thing is it's approved for age three months and up. In reality, I hardly use it. Um, I think the study data looked much more promising than what patients can actually tolerate because the stinging and burning with application is often so severe that patients won't use it. 
The newest drug that came out was toxical, topical uh, ruxolitinib, which is a JAK inhibitor. It was just recently FDA approved for age 12 and up. I, uh, before this talk, asked around with the people in our department, and uh, I haven't found anyone who's actually started using it yet. If any of you have, please, at the end, I'd love to hear your experience. Um, I, I'm not an early adopter with new medications, and um, while the topical side effects largely are stinging and burning, um, some patients in the studies did develop upper respiratory infections and headache. And although the, there's no long-term data, there's still concern for could there be systemic JAK inhibitor adverse effects, those of which you guys know are lymphoma infection, increased major cardiac risk, again, with systemic JAK inhibitors, and the thrombosis or clotting risk. So uh, it may have a role in the eczema um, management strategies in the future, but for me, it's still uh, a little early. And then phototherapy, especially for adult patients with narrowband UVB, is a great option either for localized hand and foot dermatitis or whole body eczema. Patients come into clinic two or three times a week. Um, the main side effect is photoaging. The good news is there's really no increased skin cancer risk, um, although if a patient's had melanoma, we may be a little bit more reluctant to jump for phototherapy. I won't spend much time reviewing the systemic anti-inflammatory agents um, prednisone, cyclosporin are great short-term options. In the long term, I mostly use methotrexate and mycophenolate, um, although there's certainly nothing wrong with using azathioprine. I'm just less familiar with it. And then <laughs> the wonder drug for atopic dermatitis, among other atopic conditions, dupilumab. It's currently FDA approved for age six and up, which is really exciting. Um, and there's good promising data with great tolerance uh, in a phase three clinical trial for age six months to five years, which would be a great uh, tool to add to the pediatric armamentarium. The most common side effects are injection site reactions and about 10% of patients develop a conjunctivitis. There are more and more studies coming out suggesting that there's this dupilumab facial redness phenotype. So if you have patients on dupilumab that have facial redness, um, send them back to Derm to talk about. And I am seeing some patients now who their eczema gets better on dupilumab, and then they develop what looks more like psoriasis. And so we're just starting to explore that perhaps the um, specific reduction in IL-4 and 13 that dupilumab does is shifting the immune system over to an almost psoriasiform phenotype. And that's kind of more to come. I don't use a lot of IVIG for um, eczema. There's probably some limited role for omalizumab. Um, I think this is really for patients who have pretty bad allergic rhinitis and asthma that's blurring their eczema. Um, otherwise, for a patient with atopic dermatitis alone, I don't reach for omalizumab. And then in the pipeline, we have some really promising trials coming up um, with nemolizumab, which is an anti-IL-31. IL-31, again, being that cytokine that's involved uh, staph super antigen triggers it. It's part of that TH2 type response. And several systemic JAK inhibitors, abracitinib and upadacitinib, as well as baricitinib, <clears throat> which uh, should be coming out in the next couple of years is my guess. I'm more optimistic about NEMO because it seems to have fewer side effects than you know, a lot of the anxiety recently about systemic JAK inhibitors. I won't believe that there's SCORAD, uh, which is a, basically an assessment tool used to assess um, objective and subjective symptoms of eczema. But if you're trying to get to picks into proved insurance companies, love to have a SCORAD included in the history. <clears throat> and it's pretty easy to do. The third pillar of controlling eczema is treating staff. I love dilute bleach baths. So I have patients put a quarter cup of bleach in a 20 gallon tub. Most tubs are 20 to 30 gallons and soak in it for about five to 10 minutes a couple times a week. And recent studies have actually shown that this is both anti-inflammatory and anti-staphylococcal, which is interesting. I'm a big proponent of mupirus and decolonization. So mupirus ointment in the nares twice a day for five days, repeat monthly. And then for some patient, patients, there's really a need for chlorhexidine, which is an antimicrobial agent to use as a wash from the neck down. They can do it weekly, a couple times a week for acute flares. Certainly some patients need systemic antibiotics like doxycycline. Um, 
And obviously keep in mind if you have a young patient with recurrent infections, especially having pyogenic infections and uh, pulmonary infections, think about is there an underlying immunodeficiency syndrome with eczema just being a sim symptom of it. The final pillar is treating itch. There was a good Cochrane review in 2019 that showed essentially non-sedating antihistamines like cetirizine, fexofenidine have really no role for eczema alone. If there are allergies and allergic rhinitis are flaring their eczema, sure, and I still prescribe it, but otherwise not for eczema alone. Sedating antihistamines, however, are helpful if they can help especially kiddos get a better restful night's sleep. And then, of course, don't forget things like sarna lotion that contain camphor and menthol, which can be very helpful in distracting to patients. And one tip I would suggest is tell your patients to keep that bottle in the refrigerator and then take it out, and it has kind of a double action. Okay, and now we'll move into the rapid fire final part of this talk, which is talking about the mix of atopic dermatitis. A disclaimer, this is certainly not all-inclusive. There's so many things that are red and scaly, um, but here are some common uh, mimics. <clears throat> Excuse me for my voice, I'm losing it this morning. So this patient, wow, an elderly patient with this weeping, crusting, very acute-looking uh, dermatitis on their face. They're even having almost pseudovesiculation on their chin. It's not eczema. And this is actually allergic contact dermatitis to the neomycin in the triple antibiotic cream they were using. Um, so some clues to distinguish this from eczema. We know that eczema on the face is much more common, especially on the mouth area in that infantile presentation and would be really rare in an adult. Furthermore, new onset localized eczema is exceedingly uncommon in the elderly population. So that can be really helpful. With that said, an older patient coming in with hand dermatitis, eyelid dermatitis, nipple dermatitis could certainly be eczema. Um, this is a role that patch testing plays, which um, we can talk more about patch testing if you like uh, at the end. So what's this? We have two knees, some shins, red scaly. Here's a zoomed in view of some of the rash on the knees. Is it eczema? Maybe. <laughs> this is asteatotic dermatitis. The other name is eczema crackalae. It's really kind of the end stage of severe xerosis, not truly eczema. Um, it really has an onset in the elderly, which again would be unusual for atopic dermatitis. And the mechanism is as we age, our sebaceous glands dry out and are not as active. Um, Elderly patients are often more likely on medications that may be drying, they may have underlying malnutrition, they may not be moisturizing, and, and many are bathing too frequently. And so we treat it much like atopic dermatitis. We repair the barrier, we reduce the inflammation, and we treat any superinfection that occurs. Here we have a patient with a red scaly rash on the chest, especially in this almost V distribution. Is it eczema? Nope, it's seborrheic dermatitis. Seborrheic dermatitis in both adults and kids is a common mimic of eczema. It's caused by a yeast uh, that loves our sebaceous glands, so it affects primarily the scalp, the nasal ala, and the nasal labial folds, but it can affect the armpits, the groin, the inframammary skin. Uh, it's strongly associated with patients with HIV and Parkinson's disease. And we manage it with topical antifungals, both creams and shampoos, topical steroids. And I often have patients alternate um, between the prescription antifungal shampoo and an over-the-counter um, to reduce the tachyphylaxis phenomenon. Interestingly, in kids, malassezia that causes dandruff can actually contribute to the atopic phenotype. Um, so sometimes treating their seborrheic dermatitis can help their eczema. Next up, we have this gentleman who has kind of shiny red spots on the forehead, the back of the hands, kind of spares the chest and upper arms on the face, extending behind the ear, but sparing this little area. These are a couple other patients with the same condition. Could look like eczema. 
This is actually a rare condition called chronic actinic dermatitis, which is used to be called photosensitive eczema. It's pretty rare. We don't know entirely what happens to cause it, but some endogenous antigen is photoinduced, meaning some sun exposure triggers an immune reaction to an endogenous antigen that then creates this often chronic eczema-like picture. Um, it is associated with eczema in childhood and HIV uh, and has positive photo testing, meaning we can do uh, testing to see how sensitive patients are to light and they have reduced thresholds to UVA and UVB. It's managed much like atopic dermatitis though. And I've actually put a couple of these patients on dupilumab with great success. Last couple of cases, is it eczema? Kind of coin-shaped, scaly, like kinified, crusted papules and thin plaques. Here's a zoomed in view. Is it an infection? This is numular dermatitis. Now, is numular dermatitis eczema? Is it profound xerosis? Who knows? We do know, though, it's really not associated with the atopic march or the atopic tetrad. So it probably really is, at least in some ways, distinct. Clinically, I would never look at this and not scrape it because my differential includes tinea. So I'm always going to scrape this patient to make sure it's not tinea, which is shown here. Otherwise, the algorithm is pretty much the same as uh, eczema. I will point out that these patients, because the skin is so thickened, um, often require stronger steroids than I would use for eczema. So I might start with clobetazole in the trunk and extremities rather than triamcinolone that I might otherwise use. Next up, okay, popliteal fossa, common eczema location, scaly, somewhat annular polycyclic eruption. Here's a zoomed in view, really prominent border. This is tinea, which brings me to one of my rules. If it scales, scrape it, KOH prep. Managing tinea is not too, not too challenging. Uh, Terbinafine cream or clotrimazole cream are two of the most common. I, there's some evidence that terbinafine may have a slight edge, so I usually reach for it first. And if it's widespread, a short course of oral terbinafine. But tinea has really varied morphologies. Is this tinea? It looks a lot like eczema. This is actually what's called tinea incognito. So the presentation is altered. It doesn't have that classic annular look because someone has been using topical steroids on it. So we've lost that usually annular advancing border. It's more widespread. And so you must treat it with, or you must do a KOH to diagnose and you must treat it the same. Here are a couple more examples of really extensive tinea corporis with profound xerosis and scale also. Here's another more classic example in the inner thigh with that uh, kind of advancing edge of scale, somewhat annular lesions, annular meaning um, red orders with some degree of central clearing. And here's some more photos that you may think are eggs and, or, uh, are, excuse me, uh, tinea, except when you scrape it, it's KOH negative. So is it eczema? What could it be? This is probably the most important mimic of eczema not to miss, and that's cutaneous T-cell lymphoma or mycosis fungoides. Um, unfortunately, the diagnosis of this is very challenging. The average time from symptom onset for these patients to getting the actual diagnosis is four to six years. Biopsies are not always conclusive, and most patients require two to four biopsies to make the diagnosis. It is a, technically a non-Hodgkin lymphoma. It's the most common type of lymphoma of the skin, and it has three main phases. There's a patch stage that looks just like eczema, and then a plaque and a tumor stage where the lesions become bumpy and raised, and those would never be mistaken for eczema. The good news is the patch stage is essentially not life-threatening. There's no uh, change in life expectancy for these patients, um, and it is a disease primarily of older adults. Uh, it, the most of the rash comes up in what we call the underwear distribution. So if you have eczema that's exclusive to the bottom, think about this. In patients with skin of color and in pediatrics, um, the hypopigmented variant rather than the red scaly variant is more common. So keep that in mind, especially when we were thinking about something like pityriasis alba as one of the stigmata of eczema. 
And then generally, there is some increased risk of systemic lymphoma and other malignancies in these patients, not even from this transforming into lymphoma, but these patients are just more likely to develop true systemic lymphoma later in life. The treatment for this, um, <clears throat> excuse me, is largely the same as eczema. We use topical steroids and phototherapy for most patients. Right on time. So in summary, I hope I've convinced you that atopic dermatitis, at least in my perspective, truly is not just a skin limited disease, but is a systemic inflammatory illness. Much like we think of psoriasis really being a systemic illness as it affects the joints in the heart. I want you to think of atopic dermatitis in the same way. The four key parts of eczema pathogenesis are skin barrier dysfunction, immune dysregulation, alteration in the microbiome, and itch sensitization. And if you don't treat each of these components, you'll be inadequately treating eczema. We still have more to learn about the atopic march. Not everything red and scaly is eczema. And if it scales, you should scrape it. The CME word of the day today is eczema, <laughs> apropos. And then I just wanna thank you again for inviting me to give this talk. We have time for questions now. Um, this QR code, if you scan it with your phone, I'd really appreciate it. This is for the Department of Dermatology or the Division of Dermatology and Evaluation for me, which helps for my uh, promotion and advancement. So if you have a second, it, it seriously takes only a couple minutes to fill out. I really appreciate your feedback. Um, and anytime, if you have a challenging patient, you just want to talk, feel free to email me or reach out to me on social media, and I'd be happy to chat with you further. Uh, thanks again for inviting me today, and I'll open it up for some questions. Well, Max, thank you. That was one of the finest dermatology talks I've heard in my career. That was really very practical, extremely helpful. I presume there's some uh, questions out there. For me, it was so clear cut. I don't really have any further. Well, you were going to talk about, uh, I thought maybe you were going to talk about allergen avoidance a little bit more when I asked you the, the question about dust mites. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Um, you know, it. these patients I generally send to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I do talk, the things that I specifically work on with my patients, I do often address that aeroallergen when the eczema is on the face and neck, and that I primarily deal with uh, just rinsing off at the end of the day. Um, you know, I deal with a lot of patients who have true type 4 sensitivity, hypersensitivity with cutaneous allergic dermatitis. Um, but when patients are convinced that they have either food allergies, really have eczema, uh, asthma or allergic rhinitis, I pretty much send them to you guys for further testing and evaluation. Any other questions from our audience? Do you, you see adults and children at the Roosevelt Clinic? So I primarily see adults. Um, I think at Roosevelt, we are limited right now to seeing, I think we can see as low as age 14, if I'm uh, remembering. Um, I know Seattle Children's is getting very, very busy. I don't have a clinic there right now, um, but uh, we do have a great crew at Seattle Children's um, if you can't get into Roosevelt. And also, if you're trying to get a kid in for um, that really needs an evaluation, feel free to you know, email me and I can help facilitate. Sometimes it's tricky getting them in at Children's. Do you do patch testing over there? Yeah, at Roosevelt, the, uh, Dr. Lisa Meyer is our allergic contact dermatitis guru. And uh, she does not only the core uh, patch testing, but she does expanded patch testing. So if you have patients who need um, specific patches to their, the shoe, their rubber in their shoes, their cosmetic products. Um, she'll actually do custom patches as well, which is, I think, she's probably the only one in the community. Um, one of the docs, um, uh, Mark Antezan at Polyclinic, does pretty extensive patch testing, not quite as extensive as Lisa Meyer. And then I think everyone else in Seattle pretty much just does the true test, which is much more limited. Anybody else? 
Well, I can guarantee you we're going to invite you back next year. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much for a, a really a very informative presentation, very pragmatic. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. It was fun to uh, review all of this and, and interact with you guys since we um, we see a lot of the same patients and work so closely. And uh, so I love this kind of cross hybridization of the two. Thanks again. I really appreciate it and hope you have a nice Tuesday. Take care.